Hi, you're watching Enemy. I'm Andrew Trendle. Uh, I am Tom Howard. And welcome to Speaky Blinders, a very cleverly named show all about Peaky Blinders. Yeah, and specifically uh, season four of Peaky Blinders, which finished last night uh, with the finale. And uh, so there's going to be millions of spoilers uh, about the season and about that episode. So if you haven't seen it, uh, stop watching immediately. Yeah, or watch it and come back. Don't leave bitchy comments in the comment section. There's no need for that. Go away, return, and then we can talk. It's going to be a good show. We've got some guests uh, who are uh, coming along later. Uh, but first of all, we're just going to discuss the season and the last episode. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to show a clip of Killian Murphy yeah. talking about season four. Here's what Gillian Murphy had to tell us. This is, look, luckily, this is spoiler free. This is what Gillian Murphy had to tell us about what to expect from season four. What can we expect from the new series of Peaky Blinders? Uh, I, think, I, I, I think there'll be a lot of surprises. I think people will be very surprised by the twists and turns that it takes. Um, you know, what, what's always been great about the show is that it's brilliant writing. That's its strength above all, you know, and then it's just our job to kind of give the writing the production it deserves. And um, so that's always been my uh, sort of impulses to, to kind of do justice to the writing. Okay, was he right? Was, did Killian Murphy uh, do justice to the writing of Peaky Blinders? I think so, because I think when, uh, when the last season ended, when, um, when uh, what's his name, Daddy Italian? Vicente. Vicente Italian got killed and they sent his wife off to America. I think we, we all thought that was the end of it. Like, all right, that's done, that's dusted. I never imagined that would be the entire crux of the next season. It was good. It was very, it was, it was very well weaved in. And I think mm. they, uh, with the using the, uh, the war with the Italians, was a way, it, was a very, it felt like a very clean season mm. of Peaky Blinders. It was like that was the main thrust of it. They kind of um, didn't... All the kind of the political manoeuvrings that Tommy Shelby was involved in in season three didn't really... They were there in the background yeah. with, uh, with Jesse and everything, but they didn't really come to the fore until the, fi until the finale. Um, so I think gave it, gave it, the, the Italians gave it a really... It, it felt very uh, slick and very tidy. And Adrian Brody was great. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think what he <coughs> gave it was a very... Because it's obviously been a very gritty period drama. What, what Adrian Brody gave it and the Italians gave it was like, kind of like a glossy Hollywood feel, but without losing any of the edge, you know? I think he was the godfather figure. He was chewing on the match. He did yeah. the voice very well, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, he did, yeah. Well, what, what, what's the genius of Peaky Blinders is... I think in a lot of shows, Agent Brody's character, the way he kind of hammed it up and had a real kind of Marlon Brando feel, would have felt a bit, uh, not silly maybe, but like a bit, mm. like a bit over the top. But because Peaky Blinders is in this, in this world that they've created that is just so, um, there's, there's a lot of fire, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of, uh, it's a kind of, it's a full throttle program. Yeah. That, uh, it's just stuff happening all the time. He totally got away with it and he kind of, it, and he became, the, you know, Tom Hardy's character is larger than life. He became another yeah. one of these enormously larger than life characters that kind of looms over Peaky Blinders. And that's part of the writing as well. <coughs> it's a very tribal programme. And him being such a bastard made it very much us versus them, you know? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. He was, and he, he really was a bastard, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but the, the political side was still there. There, was, there always needs to be a, a side story. And um, the communist thing, I think, was brimming under the surface. I think that'll come to the fore in the next season. But. Yeah. Well, so, so in the in the finale, I I fully, I was totally, uh, I was hooked, line <laughs> yeah. and sinkered with the. I thought, I, I mean, it seemed ridiculous to me that Tommy Shelby might hand yeah, over. Yeah, he's, he's been through of, so much already. That, they're done with that now. They'll come back to that next season. In the last ten minutes, he went. Actually, communism. Let's sort that out. Yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, no, that was amazing. In the last ten minutes, it was like he went from being uh, the gangster that mm. he sometimes is uh, yeah. into being becoming a full sort of. Jeremy Corbyn type figure, yeah. who uh, managed to become the uh, yeah, Labour MP for Birmingham South, and it feels like I, I feel like the, you know you know there was that scene where he handed over his conditions to the the guy. Yep. I'm still not actually sure who that guy was, yep. and the guy was like, "You can't be serious." <laughs> he must. Well, I, I'm thinking in Tommy Shelby's head, he's thinking, "I'm going to be prime minister." I'm going to be prime minister. <laughs> totally. That's what yeah. he's thinking. Yeah. And so he's got he's he's he's, he's one rung up the greasy ladder. Yeah. But at that point, I just thought that was hilarious because it was like it was like, all oh, right, this, can, this is going to be the new like House of Cards now or something. Imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's good, isn't it? Isn't it? Nice, nice manoeuvrings. But um, yeah, well, as you say, the character development of Tommy has been incredible, and for others as well. Polly went from outsider to villain to mother figure. Yeah. That was pretty good. 
Well, it just it just does such a good job of like tricking you into believing. Like, I again, I I kind of believed that Polly was was uh, conniving with Luca to have mm. I thought, yeah, okay, I can believe that because you know they obviously the, the season started with them all having fallen out. Polly was in. A particularly bad way. She mm -hmm. definitely wasn't feeling fond of Tommy at that point, was she? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, okay. And then, but then it just does that. It does. The, it just does an amazing job of kind of just doing it. Suddenly, just going boom, and then everything you thought you knew, you didn't know. Yeah. Same with uh, Alfie as well. Yeah, man. Dead. Is he though? <laughs> Is, Is he, he dead? dead? Do you reckon he's dead? He got shot there, and then he fell down. Yeah. I reckon he's still alive, man. Cancer though. Well, he'll die eventually, <laughs> but he didn't. I don't know. I think, he, I think he's too big a deal for Peaky Blinders to lose. He is a main character without being a main character. People look forward to him coming on screen, you know. Um, it was almost a trade-off though, wasn't it? Because we thought we'd lost Arthur. Yeah. Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> thought we'd lost Arthur, but we hadn't. Yeah. Right? But I, again, I believed that. Like, but that's I was... what I mean. The first, the first half an hour was like an episode within itself. Everything mm. happened. You went, oh, no, it could have ended there. And then it went, oh, no, undo all of that, one by one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good. It was magnificent. And then, yeah. um, right, other new characters. So uh, there was um, the Gold family. The Gold family. Who was? Uh, they were. They were quite cool. Because obviously, um, as you were saying, the Godfather thing, where it's like, well, just when I think I'm out, they drag me back in. Um, they became a legitimate rich family. Then they had to go back to Small Heath, and they had to go back to their roots. And in doing so, they had to go back to their gypsy roots as well. And in come the Gold family, with some amazing characters. Yeah, Aidan Gillen. Mm -hmm. Of uh, Game of Thrones, of course, and the Wire, and he was a uh, shifty fella. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and uh, well, a guy who, and then Bonnie Gold, who obviously was the kind of um, star of the boxing match at the uh, in in the last episode, where he um, defeated. What was it called? What was it Goliath. Called? Goliath. Yeah, he yeah, called yeah. him Goliath. Yeah. Yeah. With some. Um, oh, that was another great bit of that episode actually, when he winked at his dad. Yeah. When he was on the floor and he just kind of went. Eight. <laughs> yeah, and then he added. Um, and uh, this is a brilliant link mm -hmm. to our first guest. A really liquid segue, I would call it. Who is uh, <laughs> Jack Rowan, who plays Bodyguard. When? Now? Where? Here? Right, you lot. Come here. I get interesting. Who plays the wager with me? Here is Jack Rowan, who played a blinder in the new series of uh, <laughs> Peaky Blinders. Thanks for coming in, Jack. And thanks, thanks for having me. How is it now that uh, the season's all over? Yeah, it's what it's, <clears throat> I've always been sort of like excited to to see everyone's work come together. You know what I mean? Because there's only so much you can like gather from like reading it, and obviously from previous seasons, well, the final product is so beautiful. Do you know what I mean? And uh, feels I mean it feels weird that it's over now, but but still there's like activity on my social media that I've never kind of had before, <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Are people being nice to you on social media? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, like, I think, I think, like, I've never, never really had anybody be, like, horrible, but... Yeah, <laughs> yeah everyone, everyone's been great, everyone's been great. Mm. So how did you come to be involved in this? I mean, were, am I right that you were just, it was the dream role of being a gypsy boxer in Peaky Blinders? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, it's always been a thing where, like, kind of mixing the two passions together, so when it came around, I was like, it's only an added bonus that it's such a... Good show, do you know what I mean? Like Peaky Blinders, you know? Because I've always, I've always said if I wanted to do a boxing role, I want it to look good. Do you know what I mean? I want mm. it to, you know, not be a boxing film or TV series that people kind of forget about, and certainly they aren't, they aren't with, with Peaky, so it was just an added bonus. That... So you are a boxer? Right? Yeah, I've had uh, 27 fights. Okay. Yeah, so, but not anymore. I've, I sort of don't compete anymore. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. What's your win-lose threshold? I won 18. That's but, pretty good. Yeah, it was all right. I mean, amateur boxing, it was more about like, you know, I don't know, like, I didn't even feel like it was about winning or losing. You know, it, it was just kind of the, the, the thrill and the, and the buzz and the, like, we never did it for money. We never did it for any sort of, you know, it was just the pure love. So even the winning, even with winning and losing, you still 
you know, when you woke up the next day, you were buzzing. Mm. Did you have to yeah. spar with someone in your audition? No, no. So I had to do. So I did a self tape for it. Okay. But right. they they asked me. Funny enough, they were like, "Could you put like maybe thirty seconds of you shadow boxing?" I was like, "No, I'm, I'm going to put like two minutes." I was like, <laughs> so I put like, you know, shadow boxing really fast. Then I was like, as it's in the twenties, so I kind of was like doing that kind of sluggish style, and then. I was skipping in it before the tape even began. Mm. So then at least they can go, oh, okay, he's, he can do that at least. Because that, I guess that's where, the, that's where his story really comes from. You know, that's Bonnie. That's yeah. Bonnie Gold, you know, the kind of boxing, boxing. Yeah, literally route. boxing your way to the top because like you started with nothing and then you, went, you wanted to be a contender. Basically, yeah. And then yeah. that's where like, I guess the Shelby's come in for, you know, mm. you know that kind of side thing. Because I mean, Aiden comes in as help and I guess Bonnie as well comes in as help, as we know, to aid the Shelbys because they're kind of shit's getting real. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, and uh, I guess, but w I, what I loved about Aiden's character was you could see that he purely, he, he, de he genuinely adores his son. So he was like, "Look, we've helped you, so now I need you to help me." Tommy's like, "What is it? Come on in, bring it." And he's like, "I need you to help my son. Actually, I need <laughs> I need your contacts to to you know back him and put him into a a place where he can." fulfill his dream which is not killing people and not being part of the mafia or it's being a champion yeah and then how was how was that early scene when they <coughs> say you're a blind that? That you know that been. was my last day really that was actually my last day yeah <laughs> so it's the first time my character speaks but like that was my last day so um I, that's that's a moment that i know that in about 20 years 40 years i'll be in the bar and i'll be like look he said it, not me. <laughs> he said it. He said out of his, you know. Um, and they let me keep the hat, so, you know, I've got that. Yeah. It's like, look, if you don't believe that's me on the screen when I'm an old man, I'll be like, look, there's the hat. But, so, I mean, what, how, how would you describe your co-stars? I mean, how much of Tommy Shelby is Killian Murphy? Oh, Killian was, like, when, like in a weird way. Like, I've always, I've always thought this, but when I met him, I was like... He literally, I know this sounds weird, but he looks like Tommy Shelby. I don't know, it was weird. Like, I was like, I didn't feel like I was meeting Killian Murphy because I watched the show. I, I kind of, first time I ever saw him was the back of his head. And I was like, oh, it's, it's Tommy Shelby, it's not Killian yeah. Murphy. But he's, he's great. He's very easy to talk to and very approachable. Like, before the scenes, he's talking in his Irish accent. I always thought he might, he might mm. take on that thing of like always talk because it's such yeah, a distinct yeah. difference. Um, but no, he's he's so approachable. Like, and then obviously, as time went on, I I done a few scenes with him. You know, we were we were having jokes before the scene. You know, but he's serious. Like, you know, when he you know he has a moment where we all stop joking and we all stop sort of talking about other things, and we just he kind of just does his thing, mm. gets into like Tommy Shelby mode, which is you and Killian share the ability to do an incredible death stare. <laughs> like, Tommy Shelby's is amazing. Cause camera one, camera two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's got these obviously incredible blue eyes. But you as well, because in that other, that other thing you were in, Born to Kill, I think. Yeah. yeah. You, have the, and you just have these, amazing, these amazingly dark, piercing oh, eyes. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, I'll leave you guys alone. But, <laughs> but you know, but, <laughs> and you can do a look, you know, there's yeah. a certain look. Is that a, is that a look you've honed Definitely. over the years? Yeah. I think it's... it's I, especially with because I guess that's where the look came from playing Sam and Born to Kill because I always wanted to to have I, I kind of before I even got the part I wanted to have this thing of like animated here but I didn't want anything here so I kind of spent a lot of time kind of trying to hone it as, as you yeah. said and to get, create that glazed feeling where but then someone's smiling and talking and being flirtatious but then as an audience member you go He's not being, do you know what I mean? And, and I guess, you know, certainly Killian has that as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, that's what it is, the glaze yeah. thing, isn't it? It's almost like, it's almost like, a, I don't know, it's just that there's a, a, dark, there's a darkness there. Yeah. Or like, or like the, you know, your face is doing one thing, but the eyes are telling a different story. Oh, like, thank you. That's, that's <laughs> what I mean. Death behind the eyes. Death behind yeah. <laughs> uh, Bonnie feels like the really, of all the new characters in uh, this season, he feels like the obvious one who's going to, who's going to, uh, potentially get a big role in the next season, especially as, as things stand, the Shelbys have no real enemies, right? Because they're all dead. I guess, yeah, yeah. So it seems like the Golds maybe are going to kind of develop, I mean, I, know, I appreciate you're on the same team as things stand, but I don't know, do you know anything about your role in? Um, no, I don't really know, know much, I mean. Do you know but, if you're in it or not? Um, uh, yeah, well, there's, I mean, the door's very much open. Yeah, um, yeah pretty, I could, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I'm, I guess I'm in it. <laughs> you're going to become a pawn. <laughs> Very much a pawn in Tommy well, Shelby's game. Well, it's, it's like there's 
en endless possibilities, you know, because the last time you see um, Abarama and Bonnie, there is it's, they've won, they've yeah. got their purse, you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. there's always that thing of, especially Aiden's character, he was always quite, you never quite know if you can trust him. Um, and then I guess, you know, even Bonnie, like the character, I only really was thinking about this the other day when I, when I, when I well, when I watched that yesterday, in fact. He, the kid's got like a, a bloodlust. Mm. You know I mean, he, 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 you know, he wants to fight. So that could be a good thing and a bad thing, especially for the Shelbys. It would be, you know, we've got a kid that's really game here. Do you know what I mean? That that wants to fight. But then at the same time, surely that's and you know, he's blank-eyed as well. You never quite. Yeah. So I guess that's a could easily be flipped. Where because he's loyal, <coughs> he's loyal to the to the gold family. He, he is only just like Tommy said in in Ep two. He goes, you know, it's good to have the kid around. He might end up taking a bullet for you one day. Yeah. I guess he's just using the Tom, Tommy Shelby and, and that sort of, that's a way to, for him to, mm. to do what he wants. So, You're going to become a soldier. You can feel it. Yeah, well, I do reckon. There's, yeah. A, there's a room for a blinder because John's gone, bless him. Yeah. Michael's been sent to New York. True. And um, by the looks of it, Finn might need a little help. <laughs> I guess, yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely would, uh, wouldn't mind getting that peaky cut. Be be <laughs> it'd be better than the one I had in the show. Yeah. With like no fringe, but like really long hair at the back. It was definitely a hat, a hat summer. <laughs> <laughs> this is another magnificent link, of course, because our next guest <laughs> is Harry Curtin, who plays Finn uh, and had uh, a great season His in first many different ways. Blood. Yeah. Mm. Talking about bloodlust, yeah. yeah. Um, so he'll be with us in a minute. Well, we're now joined by Harry Curtin, who plays Finn Shelby, previously the kinder blinder, <laughs> but <laughs> has now uh, had his first taste for uh, gouging someone's eyes out. Yeah. <laughs> well, since, since so in the first season, episode one, uh, John died, obviously, which kind of sparked the, sparked the war. Yeah, um, And then it was, it was your character's time to step up, and he, bit, bit shaky. Not, he, wasn't, he wasn't mad on that idea. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's obviously shocking to have, like, a brother down. Like, as much as it's like a... Um, like they're in a gang, like they're about that life that they know that they've got like that gang life. You know what I mean? Like they've yeah. gone, someone's gonna get shot one day, yeah. and one of the brothers got shot, and you don't really see it. I know we have a funeral, but like you don't, I don't think you, especially with Finn, you don't see any like emotional, like you don't know what's going on in anyone's head. Obviously, you know what's going on in like Tommy's head and Polly's and Arthur's, but um, there's never a moment where you just see Finn actually emotionally like, and then. Uh, events happen through the series where I just think it is just brewing in him but at heart I'm not gonna lie I think Finn just is like like I think like Tommy's like brain Polly's spirit Arthur's um, Arthur's fists I think <laughs> Finn's just like heart like, like I think naturally like he knows he has the blood and the bones of a killer <clears throat> but he just has a heart of just protection I think because his brothers have given him that yeah. he does have a soft spot and I think, but then you took two of his brothers, so you, you can't do that. <laughs> you just can't. <laughs> like, you, someone's gonna die. And I think even in the scene, like, you see, like, like it's foreshadowed with Arthur just to be like, just flick the switch, man. Yeah. Just flick the switch. And well, that's a great, that's a great scene. That was a real sort of like a real like uh, a real sort of um, murderer's yeah. way of you know dealing with the fact that they he basically told me, yeah, how to just yeah. be okay with killing someone, <laughs> which yeah. isn't good. Like, that's not good life advice at all. <laughs> he should have just said, just walk away. But yeah. I think yeah, it's good though because he knows that's what our life's about, and I think he like Finn needed that talk because I think on that day where Tommy was just like. Like take his eyes. I forgot what he says now. I'm pretty sure he says. Take, take his eyes. Do it for Arthur. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Take and his fucking eyes. Yeah, literally, literally. Yeah. And I think even even the scene was intense. Like it, even like, me, like Harry was a bit like, oh, sh all right, I'll take his eyes. <laughs> okay, sorry. You know what I mean? But yeah, just give me a minute. Like, yeah, just give me a minute. Because yeah, you do have to process. Like it's like it's like the first time I guess like you lose your virginity. You're a bit like. I don't know what this is gonna feel like. <laughs> yeah. I really don't. And then when he does it, like I think you see like. 
And me as the actor, I'm quite scared of like he enjoyed it a bit too much. <laughs> like he did it and he was just like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, did, do, you think, did, do you think he did? He did. He was into it. Yeah, like I think once he did it, it's like uh, the amount of adrenaline that was oh, going yeah. through my body. Oh, I couldn't yeah. imagine the amount of adrenaline that would have been going through Finn's body, like if I was like, uh, I don't want really to ruin the illusion, but if I was really, like, really him, like that must have been a horrible experience, yeah, but yeah. great because. You felt like, as well as a gang member, you just earned your stripe, like... And it was such a cool way, because I blinded someone, like, I really did. Like, you've got no eyes now, mate. Like... <laughs> gone. You're gone. Yeah. Like, I didn't shoot anyone, I didn't, like, you know what I mean? Like, it was, it was good. It was, like, a good first time. It was proper, like... Yeah. Yeah. It was good old... <laughs> it, was as good as, it was as good as the first time taking someone's eyes could have been. Yeah. Uh, uh, so someone, well, yeah. I was just going to ask, what okay, about taking the eyes, right? Is it literally just cutting them, or do you literally scoop them out, pop them in your pocket? Take them home. I don't want to touch them. Like, they're your eyes, mate. But you ain't, they're not, actually, no, they're not your eyes anymore. They're no one's eyes. They're on the floor. He's <laughs> like, dead, don't need that yeah, guy now. Yeah. yeah, he's. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, though, because they obviously they didn't tell Finn about Arthur dying. So, yeah. like, the only people they told were uh, yeah. um, his wife, Polly. Polly and Tommy. Yeah. The only ones who knew. Yeah. So, Finn, you, you were just kind of left hanging. Yeah. So, it was almost like you were manipulated. Tommy manipulated Finn by, yeah. ten, by make, helping, making you believe that Arthur was dead so that you did that. I wonder if Finn's going to be like, huh. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Like, like, you just don't know where Stephen Knight's going to go with the storyline. You just, you just don't. But I, I th you can guess some things. I, I, the, 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 I reckon there is going to be a point where Finn's just a bit like, I'm out. Brother, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Do I, we have a life? Like, what are you actually like? And, and to which brother? Uh, tell me, tell me. Or tell maybe me. he'll run his political campaign, take a nice little office job. Yeah. That's yeah, you know? the future, man. <laughs> yeah. The politics. I, but I, I reckon, like, uh, even though it seems a bit brutal that he didn't tell him, like, I think he knew. Like, OK, when you're in, when you're in a gang life and you are, uh, you're Peaky Blinders and you have a reputation and you've done things, like, the Peaky Blinders have done things where it's just like, that's wrong. But. Obviously, it's the bigger minds so what you expect. But then you're always going to try and be like, you're always going to try and achieve either number one spot where like we are the gang, like you just don't, like we are the blinders, like we're on top. But then it's also when you have a name for yourself, people are always trying to attack you. So I think there's never, there's always going to be enemies for the blind, the blinders. There's yeah. always going to be enemies, and I think Tommy knows that, and and Arthur knows that, and I think just oh, they all know that. But then they're they're kind of a bit shit with emotions to be honest yeah so they just kind of like they they internally like subconsciously gave finn the tools to handle the pain and the the tax like it's going to be so taxing to actually process like i just killed someone and it's not as regular i like arthur like he got to the stage where he flicks the switch and when he killed adrian brody like luke shingressa it was just blau dead switch back on Jim. yeah <laughs> yeah literally yeah. whereas finn it was like Ooh, I'm flicking the switch, but it's not, it's not like, and then, and then it took his brother to just shout at him and be like, just do it. And it, Finn needs that, man. Like, cause you, like, what happens when he has to kill like five people? Yeah. And if you hesitate in like a fight, you're dead. Well, it was that moment where you had the gun, remember, and you kind of, in Yeah. Yeah. What was it? It was like three. That was yeah. when, three. Three. The, when they had the, uh, when they went around that woman's house. Yeah. yeah, well, that was when yeah. the, yeah, was the last last yeah. chat. Yeah. Yeah. moment, and then if there was ever a time to prove yourself, I guess it was that yeah. moment with, with um, the WAP. Yeah, you guys. yeah, yeah. The WAP. Do you think and it's <laughs> do you think it's a bit of a head fuck for Finn? Because I lost count of the amount of times in previous episodes where they've asked him to leave the room or been like, "Shut up, child," and now it's step up, take someone's eyes. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a very it's a weird relationship to say the least, and I think, <laughs> I think the normal family dynamic. Yeah, like, yeah, they've, they've been through, like, I've ha I have not been to war, like, Finn has not been to war, his brothers have been to war, they are killers now. Like, you can't, you can't undo the things that they've seen, you can't undo the things that they've experienced, and I think they also do have some innocence where they kind of don't want to involve their brother in this, but how can they not? And then I think they've realised this, mm -hmm. and also, I think, like, you know how sometimes, like, you, you, you feel like you want to do multiple things, but only time can tell? And the, when John died, I think Tommy was just like, yep, it's time that Finn needs to just be one of us now. Mm. And I feel like before that, maybe, like, honestly, I feel like Tommy and Polly and, like, just the family kind of didn't want Finn to go down the exact same road, mm. but still have, <laughs> still know what it's about. 
So yeah, I mean, yeah. the war thing is a really good point actually because all all those like nineteen twenties gangsters are all kind of ex soldiers, right? And then so Pretty much, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then yeah. You, Finn almost represents the kind of the next generation who, yeah. haven't, who haven't been to war and so don't have that yeah. don't have that yeah. soullessness. Maybe. Well, there's yeah. Bonnie who's just used to beating the shit out of people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But even then, even then, like that's so. There's a good point. Just to, I'm not going to do it too much, but he in the professional fighting world, like at the end of the day, like there's killing someone and there's fighting someone and knowing that someone can just be like, yeah. right, stop. Yeah. There's like sang- the, there's rules. rules. Yeah, there's yeah. rules. Whereas the life that Finn has, especially with the brothers that he has, he knows there are no rules. So that could be quite dangerous. So maybe this war with the Changres, that'll be his war. You know, this yeah. is the moment he hardens kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't know, like, we took, um, I forgot his name is, but we took um, Shangretta, Luca Shangretta's father. Yeah, you know I mean, Arthur, bang, he's dead. Then Luca Shangretta came, we killed him. So what's next, man? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm scared for them. Yeah. Like, what is next? Nazis. Like, it's just Nazis. literally Nazis. like... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> literally, it's going to be Peaky Blinders versus... Yeah, yeah man. Well, you yeah. mentioned Capone, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. I just that was beautiful. Yeah, that's really good. I love good. that, yeah. Sort of Conspiracy by the way, <laughs> references. That, that was great, but that, that almost felt like... I love that, because then it was like, oh, wow, this show's going to merge into the Boardwalk Empire now. Yeah. It's going to become this uh, big kind of... Maybe, uh, they'll, maybe they'll go after Hitler. <laughs> Transatlantic uh, gangster <laughs> epic, yeah. But I'd love that if Al Capone kind of, because I guess that that's another big storyline that could be explored, right? Is the mm. fact that there's the booze in America, yeah. and obviously Michael's gone. Michael's out there. there now. There is yeah. an industry which, yeah, like you said, like it's being, it's it's, it's going to pro- happen. It's prohibition era, isn't it, in America? So there's lots of yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. I, like I reckon you'll just see like what was Al Capone? Like I'm not going to act like I know who that is because I really don't. So he was, this, he was in it was Chicago. He was. Yeah. He, yeah, yeah. He just made loads of money. Was from, he, so yeah, look, it was Scarface, wasn't it? I only know this because of what. No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. He's made Scarface loads of money from Tony booze. Montana. Oh shit. There was a fil- who is, there's a film about Al Capone. Al Capone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Stephen Gray. It's the Untouchables, play. isn't it? Yeah. Something like that. I'm not sure. I don't sure. fangirl too hard, guys. Come anyway, on. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, edit this bit out because uh, we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but I was saying, like, with the Al Capone guy, like, I just imagine, like, you're, you're, everyone will get excited, like, oh my god, like, and then you'll just see Finn with, like, a rifle, yeah. Yeah. and then it'll be over, like, yeah. just over, and so then with, Nazis. With, I was going to say, with Michael, so he's also been, he's kind of been banished, right? Because he kind of betrayed. Well, well this, is, this is my question. Has is, is he been banished because he, he sort of betrayed Tommy because he didn't warn him? about the alleged plot to kill him or that, or has he just been sent over there to deal with the booze stuff? Oh, I've not thought about this. I've not thought about <laughs> this. Um, I actually, I don't think even Tommy knows. I don't think he knows what to do with him. Yeah, yeah. But he thought, I know he's, he's part of his son. He's a valuable part of the industry that is Peaky Blinders. Like, let's go like, we're not just brothers who are good at fighting anymore, like, we're in the industry, like, we are businessmen now. And I think he knows, like, especially with what Polly wants, like, he knows that Michael needs to be about a different life and not about the gang life of just, like, that. Because even though he's good at it, like, he needs someone that... Uh, naturally, just Michael has a very a gravitas behind him, like, he has a certain, like, stature, mm. where just, like, if you ask Finn to do that, I mean, I don't know, like... You never know, but I feel like if you ask like, Finn to do that, Finn will just be like, fuck it off, like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm, like, but whereas Michael has a very, you know what I mean? He, you got to use your tools. Um, yeah, Tommy knows Michael's a tool. I mean, he got broken. Like, yeah, but I think he's injured now, right? So yeah. he can't necessarily be the yeah. kind of as physical as maybe like Arthur is. Like, Arthur couldn't do what he does if he had a kind of... Well, mm. actually, I can't know what Michael's injury is. He just got shot in the leg or something? Because he got walkies there. Oh, he got proper... They oozied him down, man. Like, <laughs> down, yeah. yeah, totally. He's in a bad way. So were, were you guys in any? Were you guys in any scenes? I can't remember if you were in scenes together. We were in. That, we were in one. We were in one or two, but like never interacted. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 Like there was a scene where in Ep Four with when when um, Alfie comes back, sort of where Finn comes in, bef- saying there's men approaching, and then then the golds come. So we always, we spoke in as in person, but never yeah. had any dialogue. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's true, that's true. We had the, the, the scene where you know where they're doing all the boxing, yeah. and uh, there's that point where um, um, where uh, uh, Tommy says he basically whispers in Finn's ear, "Arthur's dead," and then I freak out a bit. Um, right, yeah. And then that, yeah, we spent. Uh, I, I probably spoke to you a bit too much on that day. Yeah. That was such a heat, like, that was such an energetic day. Great, great. It was like 
That was great. Well, day I say it, like, it was more like, like a week, th- it was like <laughs> two weeks long, <laughs> two week long day. But yeah, no, it was great. Yeah, so we didn't actually like. I, I would actually love to see what a scene between us two would be like. Yeah. It might I'm literally sure. just be like me, you, and possibly Isaiah just on a mission. Yeah. <laughs> like, like assassination. Like you act like you're being all professional. And being like, yeah, let's have a fight. And then I reckon Arthur, um, Arthur, Finn and Isaiah will just come in and just be like, blow, <laughs> like <laughs> dead. Yeah. And then, yeah, man, next generation, you never know what's going to happen. That's it, next generation. And uh, you ready? This is going to be amazing. Well, I was going to say, that dream scene between you two, what track would you have playing? I imagine. Don't know. <laughs> Instantly just trap and hip hop yeah. just get into my head. <laughs> I just. Uh, um, what that would be a good th- a new thing for the Peaky Blinders soundtrack to explore, though. Half and hip hop. Has there been any hip hop on it? Hasn't there? Pogues no, is a good show. No, no. Pogues. Yeah. Yeah. Even though none of us are really Irish. Oh, yeah. possibly like this is just me because I just l- I really like this guy, but Post Malone. Like, mm. <laughs> have you ever f- heard his yeah, song Fall Apart? Like I Fall Apart or something like that. And like he has a very like emotional voice. And like, if he, if he actually like made a song for Peaky Blinders, like I reckon it have like it would be sick. Yeah. Like, and like his type of music, like he just like he, he knows how to play guitar, and I think that would be cool. Like, like post you know, Malone yeah, like Peaky. slow mo, like post Malone singing, not rapping. That would be awful. <laughs> <laughs> for, no, oh, I said that wrong. You know in, what I mean? In the context, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you'll have your chance to put it to the guy behind the soundtrack now, because we're about to meet Anthony again. And we're back now with Anthony again, who's responsible for the soundtrack to Peaky Blinders season four. Responsible. Responsible is a strong word. <laughs> well, <laughs> me and my partner, Martin Slattery, who I've worked with for over 21 years. Longer than he's been married, that, isn't it? Jesus. Yeah, you get less murder. You can do double murder and be out of that. Uh, this is before we were born. It's before you lads were born, isn't it? Jesus. Well, no. Uh, making me feel old. <laughs> the vegan diet's very age like replenishing. Yeah, looking good, like, <laughs> looking I'm actually 55. Um, you, yeah, I am responsible for it, or me and Martin are responsible for it. Um, well, certainly me and Martin are responsible for the score, and um, you know, I have also have the had a job of kind of choosing the music as well, mm. which has been you know been a laugh. Been amazing. The, the, the finale of the finale. The finale of the finale, what's Hard that? Hard Rain's gonna call. Gonna call? Is Hard it? Hard Rain's gonna fall, sorry. Yeah. Why would you know that song? It's only Rain's Bob Dylan. Is this new, <laughs> new, <laughs> new little photo called Bob Dylan. When we, when we went through yeah. this. Rob Millen, I think we it's went called. Through this this is Bob Dylan from Rob Millen. <laughs> A Hard Rain is gonna fall. This, That's what it's called. This is going to seem like I'm lying. This is the enemy. It's going to seem like I'm laughing right. about me. I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. You're watching this. Huge Bob Dylan fan. Don't listen to these people. They're fools. They don't know what they're doing. I, yeah. I'm I'm okay. I, know it. I know that's I know. wrong. Anyway, Horror's going to fall, but Laura yeah. Marlin doing it. Laura Why that Marlin. song? Why that song? Um, you know. I shall be descended the stairs. <coughs> He's a blue eyed boy, isn't he? He's a blue eyed boy. I've got to say, I would love to take um, credit for choosing that song, but it was actually Karen Manderback who is the, the, the producer, the mm-hmm. Grand Fromage, the Big Cheese. Yeah. And she had an idea to do it. And there was a version that Patti Smith did. I think it was, um, I can't remember what, she did a live version of it. Uh, it's on YouTube, actually. She kind of fucks you up and then apologizes and starts and, and kind of carries on. It's, it's pretty beautiful. Got to love Patti Smith, right? Uh, and she kind of suggested that. And then, um, and then I thought Laura Marlin would be great doing it. So mm-hmm. we got, well, we got Laura into the studio and she did, um, you know, <coughs> Red Right Hand for the opening of it. Yeah. And then we thought, let's have her at the start and have her, have her at the, the back end, and um, you know, I wanted to play it with some balls. You know, I mean, Bob Dylan's version is great, but it's a bit, you know, drivelly, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and Laura's like, Laura gives it some. Yeah, but it you was know. the blue-eyed sun bit. That's the bit that was like the the, the link to. Uh, well, you know, I guess it, it, there's a bit of optimism and a bit of cheekiness to it. You know, and a bit of balls to it, and it's, you know, it's not just like some pussy-ass folk version. Laura marlin has got a lot of balls. You know. And uh, she's got attitude, and it really comes out in that track the way she does it, you know. Yeah, I think that, that's what they need. I remember Gillian Murphy was doing a thing on uh, Six Music of the Week, and they asked him, what do you look for in a band or an artist who's going to be uh, in the soundtrack? And he said, they need to seem like an outlaw. Yeah, it was actually me who said that, lad. You said that? Yeah, no, I was right. sat next to him in that interview. There you go, it was you. Yeah. <laughs> Killian's from Cork, I'm from Sheffield, got different accents. <laughs> look, look out for it on the radio. I know it was on the radio, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, no. But we've, we we talked about that in the beginning. You're absolutely right. Me and me and Kill, 
uh, and uh, David Caffrey. I've known Killian for many years, and he's got great taste in music, and he's a real music enthusiast. <coughs> uh, sounds like a train enthusiast. He's a music enthusiast, <laughs> but well, you know, he's just always looking for new music and and stuff. And um, so we talked a lot about that in the beginning. It was Killian actually called me and asked me, you know, if I'd be interested in getting involved in Peaky. Um, and he's known me and Martin for years, and was a was a fan of our band. <coughs> the hours that we had for about twenty minutes, um, uh, and um, you know, so he's someone that I respect. So we talked a lot about music, and the whole vibe was. You know, Tommy Shelby's an outlaw. You know, these lads are outlaws. Especially that lad who's getting into slicing people's eyes up <laughs> these days. If you ain't seen it, he turns into a right nasty fucker, this one, <laughs> let me tell you. He's a nasty fucker anyway, but he turned into a right badass. <laughs> God knows what's going to happen in Series 5. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that was the thing, an outlaw. And, and there's a lineage of music, outlaw music, from Nick Cave and, and uh, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds and the music that Nick, Nick does with Warren Ellis. And then PJ Harvey in season two that they did with Flood and um, excuse me and um, you know Jack White and other music that's appeared in this uh, this show over four seasons the, you know the backbone of it uh, the DNA of it is in this kind of vibe of of being an outlaw yeah so the people that we wanted to pull in um, you know obviously have got to have that gene got to have that in them that kind of I don't give up. Fuck. Yeah, savages, kind of savages especially have like us v them kind of thing about them, don't they? Well, I mean, you know, have you seen Savages play live? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you ain't walking out of that gig going, oh, a bit pussy, I'm <laughs> not, really, not really feeling it, you know. That is like, boom! You know, that's some, you know, slamming outlaw shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd have loved to do something with, uh, with Jenny for the show, you know, and we, we were talking to her to do some st something, but it just didn't quite happen for a, a few reasons, and she was off doing a film. And we, for, there was another reason, really, that. We just couldn't quite make it work, but uh, maybe in season five we we, we could get something going with uh, with Jenny Beth because mm. she's she's pretty amazing. But you know, we also got Iggy Pop. Yeah, the biggest um, outlaw of them all. No Iggy, no nothing, man. <laughs> I'm gonna make that T-shirt. No Iggy, no nothing. Um, we got Iggy and uh, and Jarvis, who's also an outlaw. You know, and Jarvis is someone I've known for well since I was 11, I think. I think I first met him, something like that. You know, and I, I had a little brief sojourn into playing bass for Pulp. <clears throat> Although, having said that, if you lived in Sheffield in the 80s and you had some arms <laughs> and a head, you were probably be being in Pulp <laughs> at some point. Um, and, uh, and they, uh, you know, we did that track Red Right Hand with those guys, um, which was great, and um, who else was in? And then also, one of the things that we, we did, which I'm particularly proud of, I must say, I must say, I'm particularly proud of it, is that we managed to sneak in Arguably the biggest outlaw in British music today. Surreptitiously through the back door, we had four versions of Skepta's Shutdown. Which, um, and I see it sometimes on Twitter, did I just hear a really <laughs> gentle <laughs> piano version of Shutdown by Skepta on Twitter? Uh, and of course, the kind of subconscious narrative in that is that, um, you know, the factory is being shut down. Jesse Eden, who's this. Character, <coughs> this union uh, character, this communist fighting for the cause. Uh, so we thought we'd give uh, that whole area and particularly stuff with her, you know, this um, this theme. And, and I don't think we could have had the um, the real shutdown in there. We couldn't have snuck that in uh, because you know I guess grime. Maybe next year. That's what I mean. Grime is technically <laughs> not peaky. We have a, we have an ethos which is like. Is it peaky? Does it sound peaky? And I, suppose, I guess that does a lot with acoustic instruments, or not acoustic instruments, but you know, instruments where you can feel the hand on mm. it, for the most part. The grime's not um, peaky. Grime's not peaky, but the attitude of grime, I mm. mean, Skepta, he, now there's one outlaw motherfucker. Mm. For, with no help from no establishment corporate bullshit, he's bulldozed his way through the wall, you know. It's like the door was shut, the portcullis was down, and the fucking drawbridge was up. <laughs> and uh, Skepta was going, I ain't coming over that wall, I'm coming through it. <laughs> you know, and you might want to fucking build it a bit thicker because it looks like some pussy ass wall to me. <laughs> and he's come through it big time. So we had to, uh, for me, I wanted to get that in there. You know, it's incredible. Did you notice that? Uh, four you know times what? it comes, four <laughs> times, Skepta. I knew we it. We love that lad. I've read, unlike you, I've read the interview. <laughs> exactly, unlike you, <laughs> lad. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. He don't even work here, he just walks down the street, this lad. I come he for works the down the road in front of yeah. I come for the free milk. Exactly. Oh, got, so I guess 
Radiohead, right? Oh, Def- definitely also outlaws. You know, they kind of do. But it felt like you kind of used their music in a slightly different way to the way you use a lot of other music. And it was very, well, particularly in the last episode, it was also yeah. when Tommy was going through his. Tommy's you know, meltdown, we called it. Meltdown. Yeah, because you had traumatic stress. You had when he was alone moment. in the house, it was you and he was army in the last season, wasn't it? And then post-traumatic, post-traumatic batterage out of your mind, fucked upness, I think we call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. medical, yeah. not a doctor, yeah. but could well, be medical. So, I can't get <laughs> over these like, phrases. <laughs> I'm, a doctor, I'm a doctor of vibe, brother. I'm a doctor of vibe. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do in that situation? It's, it's difficult when you have to have a, a piece of music that bridges the whole thing. Now, I think that one of the things that has evolved in this season um, is that we've done a lot of tracks ourselves. I mean, yeah. um, Amelia, who licenses all the music and is a music supervisor on the sh- on the show, doing all the licensing and stuff, has called us up a few times and said, "Oh, what's this track? That's uh, you know this track at the beginning of episode one, the one with I've been googling it. Uh, it goes no heaven, no hell, no innocence, but I can't find the lyric. You know who who is that track? Do we license it? It's like it's us. We wrote it." <laughs> You know, it's me singing love. That's who it is. Um, because you can't have uh, a track that for six minutes is going to have every little nuance and every little, you know, dip and then raise up and all that stuff. You're just not going to get it. I mean, mm. even with something like Pyramid Song, you know, I still had to do a little bit of cheeky. Not that I think you'd notice. Mm. The Falls track at the beginning of episode things. four. Sorry, Falls, if you hate me for doing this, but I love that track and I had to get it in there. There's, oh, it's 16, snake oil, it? there's 16 edits in that track. Really? Yeah. Oh, you didn't tell them? I mean, well, it happens all the time. It's not like, right. it's not like you know, your phone's not going, <laughs> right. you know, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to do 16 terrible edits on you. It's not like we're <laughs> editing it mid-word. I'm, right. What I'm saying is that <laughs> to make something work so that the di- it fits with the dialogue and then goes up with the drama, you know, it, you can get that from tracks sometimes. Yeah. And you can certainly get that track if you get a track and you get it in early to the edit and then you can cut to it. But, you know, it just ain't always the way. You know, sometimes it's horses for courses and you just have to do things in different ways. But um, that's one thing that we did. And, you know, there's a track where, where Bonnie is boxing in the factory. And that track is, runs for a long time. And then there's some vocals come in. It's uh, a friend of ours, Ollie Burslem from Yak, who we also yeah. used a mm-hmm. wicked Yak track called yeah, yeah. Alas Salvation. Alas! <laughs> Salvation! I mean, that guy's an outlaw. He's <laughs> fucking wild, I tell you. But we love him. And, uh, and he came and he sang on that and he played some wicked guitar on it. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of have to get that... Use, your, use your, your, your kind of idea of the narrative and, to, <clears throat> and your skill to get the drums down and get the, get the, the vocals up and all, all that kind of stuff, you know, make the arrangement work around the dialogue. Um, and you just can't do that when you're just banging a, cha- a Jack White tune on there, or, yeah, yeah. or, or whatever it is. So we tried to make that evolve in this season. I think we, you know, I think we did it pretty good. And, what do you think about these guys' good. characters, Bonnie and Finn? Which what music or artists pop into your mind as being particularly suitable? Well, there's for a that great bit actually with, with with Finn, uh, um, where we kind of had a reprise of the first that kind of No Heaven No Hell track in the, from the first uh, episode, which is the opening of the, of the first episode. We reprised that at four both these guys, because it's over the, his boxing match, uh, and, it, and it runs through that whole thing. Um, so that's kind of, it's got, it's got like a, it's, it's dirty, it's filthy, but then it's also got some heroism in it. You know, it's quite heroic for this lad. When you win your boxing match, lad, <laughs> you did well, lad. I'm proud of you. Thank you, thank your you. Your mum and dad are proud of you. Um, he kicks that big Goliath's uh, arse, smashes the shit out of him. And, um, yeah. and you know, and he gets up on the ropes, and the strings come up. Um, I'd have actually liked it if I had a little more, but it's so fast moving, episode six, that you know, I'd have liked to have given you a bit more heroism there, but then we're off. I, get, I tried to give you a bit, lad. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and, then, and then it's off, and, and then, but then the reason why it's off is because we're down the corridor with this lad. Yeah. Sorry for stealing your thunder, bro. Like, uh, <laughs> that song would have been so beautiful. We had to move on, to, but, the, but you know, so that track is very driving and very forceful, and then, you know, um, Tommy turns to Finn and says, Take his eyes, Finn, for Arthur. And then we get all the dirty, rotten feedback and the strings are all... We use this wicked string section called Dirty Pretty Strings, uh, who are all women. Um, and they really got it. I mean, they're, they're the people that play the strings all the way through, yeah. um, which feature you know, very heavily. Um, and they just had it. They just had such a great understanding of the aesthetic of, of what it is and kind of the DNA of it. A lot of it in, in kind of... You know, Nick and Warren stuff. 
Um, so, um, you know, it's been a great little journey to try and fit together all this kind of stuff, these pieces of the jigsaw and do music that accentuates the characters. Mm. And these lads are, um, you know, I wonder what's going to happen to these lads as, as we go into episode, uh, season five, yeah, sorry, yeah. because, if, you know, you Finn's have... definitely upgraded <laughs> yeah. from kind of, you know, <laughs> to, to, to like, yeah, I'll just fucking slice this Jesus <laughs> pupils out. <laughs> there you go, lad. If you had to pick one band or artist who encapsulates Tommy Shelby, who would it be? Jesus. Um, one band or artist that encapsulates Tommy Shelby. I don't think you can. I don't think you can because, I mean, that's, that's the thing about Tommy Shelby. You've got to understand, this geezer's come from, you know, he's a gypsy who's come from the streets who's now in fucking politics, dude. <laughs> yeah. You know, if there's anything, I guess you could say with that, uh, maybe someone like Radiohead in the fact that they've evolved, that you think they're this and then they're this. And that's the, that's the thing about all great bands and all great artists of any kind is that they can't be pinned down and um, you know you can't quite get a, a, an angle on what they are because they're always evolving and always moving and, uh, and that's Tommy Shelby, he's always moving forward. Who knows what's going to happen to him next? I mean the geezer's gone from being an absolute shitter from Nowheresville, you know, <laughs> slashing people's eyes open to now um, you know, rocking it with the politicians in Parliament with an OBE and you know, hanging about with uh, the hoi polloi. So, I guess musically, anything. Well, like, are, there, are there any particular tracks or artists that you think are peaky that you would like to work in, or are you, are you purely reacting to what's on screen? You're always reacting to what's on screen, you know. I think that um, the story's in charge, always, you know. In recent years, you know, we, me and Martin both come from a, a background of being in bands, you know, Martin was in Black Grape, I was in Port when I was a kid, we both played with Joe Strummer and you know, then we had our own band, The Hours, we produced records for people, we'd done all this kind of stuff. And we have this motto, the music's in charge. We're not in charge, the music's in charge. You've got to listen to what the music is telling you to do. And in the same way, when you're working in film, we've done quite a lot of films now, uh, and, and working now with this TV series, the first TV series we've done, but um, you know, when you're working with pic music to picture, the story is in charge, always. You know, what you want to do is really, you know, it's irrelevant. You've got to listen to the story, look at the characters, and tune in to that vibe and get on that frequency. And then that will be revealed. So series five is a whole another animal. And Stephen Knight, who's a writer of you know extremely complex um, his characters and the way he weaves in stories. I mean, that episode six, I mean, you didn't know where you fucking were. One minute you're over here, next minute you're over there. And, uh, and that's what he's great at. So, you know, you just got to follow that and follow his lead. Um, there's no way, in the, coming into it, we said, we did talk about Savages, and we did talk about Laura Minor, but we knew the script, so we knew what was going on. So you got to react to the story. Um, there's people, obviously, that you'd like to work with. I'd like to do something with Patti Smith. I think she's great. Anyone who's an outlaw, badass motherfucker who don't give a fuck, <laughs> you know, you know, you've got to, you've got to get them on the phone. Pretty, Absolutely. Right. Pretty <coughs> good liquid segue into talking about season five. Back in a second. So, season four is done. And uh, I think we're actually not going to get season five until 2019. Yeah, 2019. Is that correct? 2019, which means there's a lot of time for people to suss out what's going to happen next. Uh, but what we're going to do now is find out loads of secret information from these guys. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should just go. <laughs> maybe we should just go along the line, and you can talk about some. What would be your dream scenarios? If you were in the pitching room, okay. what would you be pitching? Okay. Um. It's one of those ones you know you have to like shut your eyes and be like, oh. Um. Honestly, I kind of feel like I want to see some. I can't describe this. I, I want to see the brothers have a moment that's not gang related, not like, I know this is their life, like they're not just like, they don't, they don't wake up on a Monday and be like, yeah, I'll, I'll go and do some like, 
I'll kill someone maybe, I'll go and do, like, I want to see some just like, I want to see a scene or just want to see like a moment where they're actually just like doing a hobby or like, I want to see like, or yeah, like, <laughs> I imagine like just tennis or something. Literally, well, I just want to see like, like it's eating. Writing. Yeah, you just just sat eat. down actually just being like, how was your yeah. day? I know that's yeah. not like, that's completely not what Peaky Blinds is, but if Stephen Knight could make that Peaky Blinder-ish, like, that's not like my dream thing, but I just, I just <laughs> would love to see just a very just, Relaxed Christmas so dinner. We saw, yeah. we saw well, we Tommy had, try golf. But there's always an <laughs> ulterior motive. Sorry. Yeah. I think you're talking about EastEnders. Like, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 What I would like to happen is for Tommy to meet Dirty Dan and Angel, <laughs> you know, and, and the Mitchell brothers. Um, no, sorry. I, I just, I, I would go along, but I don't know what, I've, ne I've never watched EastEnders. You want to watch, you want to watch <laughs> Shelby's Day Out? It's a classic <laughs> theme tune. And last. it haunts me till it's one today. One of the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you mean you want to know how, like, you know, how does Arthur like his cakes, his cake, his steak cooked? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. but then I think it's a dream scene. <laughs> yeah. He does look That's cocaine. how he likes it. Cool. A little, <laughs> okay. a little dusting of cocaine so in there. Yeah, cocaine, I mean, cocaine, cocaine in his meal, <laughs> flash fry it, you know. There's a lovely crispy top there, get stuck in. There you go, yeah. with this a bit of fucking whiskey sauce on it. This is absolutely delicious. delicious. Jack Daniel's sauce. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Okay. Bob's your uncle, lad. Bob's your uncle. That's Arthur's diet. I mean, <laughs> it'd be pretty epic to see them when they go to America, though. I just want to see a scene where, like, it's a bit like, I, like obviously, yeah, the way I describe it, don't do the way I describe it, just, <laughs> yeah. And like, I just want to see all the brothers come in, like, including Bonnie, and just, you know what I mean? I just want to see a scene where we just come in and we're just, like, literally, like, not literally, but you know what I mean? Like, kicking down the door of America and just being like, yeah, like yeah. that kind of like don't fuck with us. Yeah, but at the same time that'll be a bit too like Hollywoody. Yeah. Well, there were those yeah. really great moments. Was it in the I can't remember if it was season one or season two where they they went out of Birmingham maybe for the oh, first time. Oh, to the London time, Club in season, season, yes. yes. season, season two. Yeah, these huge fights in these big London yeah. clubs. Yeah, that was brilliant. That was it's great, happened before. Yeah. People from Birmingham have smashed down the doors of America before. Led Zeppelin. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. There you go. Slade. They, they could be the Duran Duran. Uh, Sabbath. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> these guys maybe did it first. <laughs> That's what you're saying. Oh, you're well, going to get Duran yeah. Duran in the soundtrack. Exactly. <laughs> How about you, Jack? You know, as much as we like Duran Duran, I don't think they're very peaky. <laughs> no disrespect to the lads, because they're good lads. Yeah. How about you? I think, specifically, I guess, for, for the Bonnie character, I would like... Because, obviously, obviously, the story will hopefully continue sort of in the boxing route. Because I, I just remember reading episode six, I was buzzing. I thought I'd get a belt. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Conor well, McGregor. A belt, I know. I You've been done there, haven't you? There's no belt for, I guess, Southern <laughs> Counties, <laughs> Midlands. Oh, they might be. You clearly know. not fighting a yeah, little like, snake yeah. belt. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I mean? yeah. <laughs> or a bit of string. You know. Fashion statement. You have a reputation to your name now, though. Surely that's a bigger belt than a piece of metal. A reputation to your name. That's surely that's the bigger. Trophy than a piece of metal. Pride. Yeah, everyone, knows, Pride. everyone knows you're a not badass motherfucker. Pride, Pride is the prize. <laughs> okay, no, it's your character, but you do. You <laughs> some amazing gypsy yeah. who wants gold wants and shiny shit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's what they're into. Time. You know what I mean? Just like, they love yeah. that shit. He wants that Lonsdale belt. Just <laughs> you can grab title. it, just bite yeah, into yeah. it, like uh, just like yeah. boom. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's not. You just want to kind of. You just want to go up the world rankings, yeah, heavyweight. I, I, I just because that's what I, like. I don't know what weight. What yeah, weight? Well, what I weight? Certainly I like. wasn't fighting a world weight. But <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm lightweight if in my real weight. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. But I don't, that's what I loved about the Bonnie character and and and, the, and the, the chance to play it just to show bo the boxing side really. So I hope hope just specifically for him. Hope that that is still a part of the story. And that, can we do? We can do like big fight sequences yeah, yeah. with and a belt. Some, and some really big cheating. Mm. He fight. just wants to fight, basically. Yeah. <laughs> he just wants to have fights. We're well, good, honest fighting. No you know. guns, no weapons, yeah. exactly. no some eyes. Some sanctions. No, some no rules. Getting blinded. Some Queensby rules. Exactly. He's a lightweight as well. He says so. Don't <laughs> go easy on the crystal, crystal cream sherry. It's Christmas time. There's no need to be afraid, apparently. And you, your turn to dream. What do I dream of? Um, I dream of being on. Um, a desert island whilst someone else is doing it. Because <laughs> it's fucking hard. That's what I dream of. I dream of just, you know, from afar going, ha ha, now you're doing peaky. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, no, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, who knows whether I'll be involved. You know, these guys are definitely involved. I don't know whether I'll be involved in, in series uh, five. Uh, we, shall, we shall see. Um, you know, they've used different people every season for the music. So they might, you know, want to change it up or whatever, and, and who knows what me and Martin will want to do at that point, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, I do think that, like anything, it has to evolve, and 
You have to see what the story says. Yeah. At the, the end of the day, the story's in charge. I'm sorry that's not like a razzmatazz answer, but the story's in charge. See what, see what Steve Knight's going to do with it. And then see what, see what unfolds from that. I think that, you know, they've had a lot of the same... The, 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 certainly, we've had a lot of music that's been, you know, choosing music that pre-exists. And we've had less of that in this season, by a lot, by a long way. You know, I think there was 20 odd, 28 uh, tracks in season uh, three. And I think we've only had like two per episode, something mm. like that, because we've done more tracks. And I'd like to evo make that evo evolve more. So we did a track with Iggy and Jarvis, we did two tracks with Laura Marlin. You know, if we were gonna do another season, I'd like to do original <coughs> tracks with people, uh, not just covers, you know, some original yeah. music. Because I think that um, as much as it's great to get tracks that work and tracks that are fantastic. Wouldn't it be great to have an original track that you did for Peaky with Tom York rather than a Radiohead track? Not that I say that Tom York could be, you know, knocking on my dog going, yeah, can I do a track with you, mate? Very unlikely. <laughs> but you know what? You've got a dream, haven't you, man? You've got well, yeah, a dream. I mean, big time. Oh, we, we thought about Iggy Pop. It's like, wouldn't it be fucking wicked to have Iggy Pop on it? Well, guess what? We've got Iggy Pop on it. Yeah. And we thought, wouldn't it be wicked to have Laura Marlin? That would be perfect. And that's, guess what? Laura Marlin did it. And so. You know. Didn't Bowie want to be involved as well? Yeah, he's dead, lad. He's dead now, yeah. That's your problem now. Prior to that, he wanted exactly. to. Exactly. Bowie been... wanted to be in it, Elvis, Lennon, <laughs> Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, they're all dead. Queen. John F. Kennedy, well, he's imagine. a fucking got well, a great baritone. Well, Jackson um, calls you every day. <coughs> what about you, Andrew Trendle? What do you want to happen in the next season? I want answers. <laughs> <laughs> to what questions? I want to know if, uh, if Alfie's really alive. I reckon he's alive. He's looking after Cyril. Yeah? Yeah. Have you ever been oh, shot yeah. in the face last week? No, the thing is, it, it I caught, was shot in the face last week. It caught him there. Put cream on that. It, it caught him there. Fortified cream works fucking wonders, I think, honestly. I think Alfie's out there, straight through. I honestly. think Alfie's too awesome a character to lose. I want to see Alfie, like... People die, man. I know, I can't I take it. This is the I'm real really, world. I'm really involved, <laughs> man. He's Cyril, a gangster. Dog, Cyril. Really involved. Yeah. I'm, I'm not... The dog is... I'm not made out to the blood off Alfie as well. Yeah, She's left there on the beach. That's a good point, actually. Yeah, is any, he must have been holding him, so he must he was trying to get off. <laughs> Those yeah. are very low. The dog was like, licking him, he was licking the blood off his face. I don't know. He's probably just like, yeah, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> probably full of fucking gin or rum, whatever he drinks. Yeah. He was licking that blood and came back to it. Have his mind, Cyril. <laughs> fucking smashed on the rum blood. Yeah. This guy's absolutely delicious. <laughs> oh, I love this lad. He's probably yeah. still there. Yeah. Hide on Margate Beach, tucking in. Yeah, exactly. Hide his body in a little yeah. cave and just. Exactly. He's probably eating the best bits. So, <laughs> my dad was a butcher, he always said, you know, if we, if we end up on a desert island, I'll know which bits to eat first. <laughs> Maybe Cyril's got that same vibe. He's eating Tom Hardy's arse as we speak. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to see if um, Alfie's still alive. I want him to be alive. I reckon he's too awesome a character to lose. And um, I want to see Tommy somehow organise the revolution, undermine it, and then fuck up the government. I know history has shown us that a communist revolution didn't happen in England. Spoiler, if you've not finished watching the news yet. But I want to see something seismic happen revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. That Maybe, is. baby, just like fucking Jezza Corbyn. Hey. It's coming, the revolution's coming. That's what it is, man. Exactly. Shel Tommy Shelby. All you rich fuckers get Jeremy ready to yeah. take your heads off! <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end. I'm not a Bolshevik, I'm from Sheffield. Oh, wait, we should end. We, sh behind us. we should end on some solid gold facts. Oh, okay. One, it's coming back in 2019. Two, there's likely to be a season six because they want it to end at World War II. Those are the only facts we know. You guys mm. don't know anything else. Am I right? Three, it's all on iPlayer over Christmas. Yeah. So. And if you're watching from America somehow. Netflix. Uh, Netflix One, two, from three. the 21st of December, it will be on US Netflix. There you go. Enjoy yourselves. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thanks to all of you very much. Oh, Merry thank Christmas. You. Thank you. Thanks Merry for Christmas. listening. Oh, yeah. You should also have a very peaky Christmas. That wouldn't be lame, would it? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> That'd be well Maybe you should all say, that. don't fuck with the peaky blinders. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs>